Welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast on real practical shamanism with me, Joseph Sykora and Damon Smith. We are here once again to talk about shamanism from the ground up. Now, this week we are going to revisit an episode that we did a few episodes ago called um, your the, the Seven Stages of Shamanism, or How to Become a Shamanism, uh, How to Become a Shaman. And there was, uh, I think we covered stages one, two, and three in that episode, which was part one. In this episode, we're going to tackle stages four, five, six, and seven. Okay? Or that's the plan. You know, we'll see where we get to. There might be a, no one knows, there might be a part three on its way, but uh, we'll see. Um, so the first thing we need to do before we crack on is thank a bunch of uh, brand new patrons, which is exciting. So Damon, do you want to uh, do you want to take over? Okay, so they're not all brand new. Um, so let's begin with a, a long-standing patron, Mr. Jason Kodowski. Uh Jason, you're a superstar, sir. Uh, Jason has just become a founder patron, uh, which is absolutely amazing. Um, I've been having some chats with Jason online recently. And um, he's doing some really cool stuff with the shamanism. He's one of those people who are a fantastic advert for our podcast because not everything that he's learned in his life, but some of the stuff that he's picked up has come from the podcast. He's been practicing it and and getting getting somewhere with it, which is just amazing. It's what we started this fun thing for in the first place, right? Well, so I remember th- you saying, even if just two or three people... exactly. Uh, took on board and actually did what we're talking about, then you'll be happy. So yeah, well, he's, <laughs> he's one a, down, a, two to go. <laughs> I don't know if we call him our, one of our guinea pigs, but just near superstar. Yeah. So thank you very much. We also have uh, new patrons. We've got Thorvan Denadin and Digma. Thanks to both of you guys for signing up, becoming patrons. And also, I don't know if Pamela, Algen, uh, Pamela, I don't know if I thanked you already, but there's no harm in thanking you again. And thanks once again to all of our wonderful Triber patrons. Uh, you guys make this whole thing worthwhile. It's amazing. Fantastic. Um, you can, of course, support us at patreon.com slash woven energy if you want to become a patron yourself. Um, it's very much appreciated. And you'll get a few a few more extra little bits and bobs as well. So there's that. Um, Damon, one thought struck me um in the in in you know to go alongside these two episodes our part one and part two of how to become a shaman or the seven stages of shamanism and that is an episode or two you did on heretics on um the chemical wedding of christian rosenkreuz yes Uh, and so i just want to give that those episodes a shout out because um as far as i'm aware that's like a blueprint for shamanic technique isn't it Yes, is in in, the, in allegory in in, the, in allegory of course. Yeah, it's it's typically couched in Western esoteric style, but effectively the chemical wedding is a, a manual of how to become a shaman, and it's it's talking about these same seven stages that that we've been going through uh, in in a non allegorical way, a technique based way on the Wolf Energy podcast. But yeah, it's yeah. it's a truly wonderful book. It's one of, I would say, the most uh, underrated works of literature in the world. It, not just in terms of its content, but also in terms of the quality of the language used in it. Writing allegories is hard. Allegories are mm. a really useful way to convey shamanic and esoteric and animistic ideas but they are so difficult to write. I know I've tried myself. <laughs> it's, they're not easy. And that, mm. you know, the chemical wedding, Christian Rosenkreuz, is about the best allegory I have ever come across uh, in, you know, lots and lots of years of learning about and researching esotericism. It, it's, it's number one in my book. So, yeah, so we did a bunch of episodes on day one. Day one is level one. It's back to Amsterdam South in Mongol, uh, Chilisti, uh, so yeah, you can go and check those episodes out. And we in, t- in future we intend to do day two, day three, day four in the in the chemical wedding and, and I, so on. I, I hope you seven. do, but it does it, it does highlight how um, how much there is to talk about because I think you did what two or three episodes already just on day one, and I don't even think yeah. you finished that one, right? <laughs> yeah, and of course, so. being heretics, we don't have the problem that we've got on the, or, or opportunity that we've got on the Woven Energy podcast. We're not trying to teach anybody how to do anything or help anybody learn how to do anything on heretics, whereas on Woven Energy, we are. So we yeah. have a bit of an advantage covering that stuff more quickly on heretics, but even so, it'll take a while. 
Fantastic. So in our part one, we covered um, a, a large portion of the episode was actually covering stage one. And then we uh, we covered stage two and three. We've already started our deep dive series of episodes on stage four. Uh, and that's ongoing. Who knows how many episodes that will be, but uh, that's going really well. I think we're on to episode five now, something like that, four or five. Um, so stage four is well underway. But um, to kick things off, should we? do you want to just give a very quick or a, a brief overview of stage four before we move on to uh, five, six and seven? Stage four, if you want to call it stage four, Guruk in Mongol, is all about energy. I mean, the whole of shamanism is all about energy, ultimately. But stage four, the Guruk, is the place where the human being really starts to sense what it's all about. Stage one is about not having tea in your cup when nature tries to fill it. Obviously, if you've got already got tea in your cup, nature's going to have a hard job filling it. Stage two is about developing uh, ways of understanding nature through your own body. It's about ways of understanding what goes on within your own body in a holistic sense without affecting what's going on within your own body, which is why stage two takes quite a bit of work. You know, just in, in simplistic terms, for instance, knowing what your heart rate is, knowing what your breathing is without affecting your heart rate or breathing, uh, that kind of lightweight observation of self, as we talk about, that's what's developed in stage two. That then supports Chalisti and Amskar, both support Bujig, Bobujig. The incidentally, Bo just means shaman in Mongol. So when I say Bobujig, I mean the shaman dance or spirit dance. Uh, also called Sam, the. the um, Mongolian shamanism, oh God, I hate that term. Shamanism in Mongolia has been heavily influenced <laughs> by Buddhism and there's, you know, different people to a greater or lesser extent. And sometimes the Buddhist-leaning shamans call it Sam rather than Bobuchik. But it's the same thing. And spirit dance, yeah? Yeah, spirit dance. But we've said before, this is a level three is about doing the legwork in terms of acquiring your shamanic technique. It doesn't have to be spirit dance. It could be drum technique. It could be uh, aragio, you know, it could be so severe austerities. It could be uh, staff technique. We were talking about staff recently, weren't we? It could mm -hmm. be just very um, uh, straightforward. Uh, interactions with nature, you know, for instance, tree climbing and that type of stuff. That there are many different ways or categories of shamanic techniques that that are all used to the same end. The end being to create a weave, which is what level four is about: to create a, a, a weave of energy, an energy weave, woven energy, if you like. And so, would it be correct to think? Oh, sorry, go on. And I was, I was just going to say, obviously, level three technique effort at level three is really important because two things. One is you want to cover the riches of nature in your level three technique, but you also want to maintain chalisti in your level three technique. And those two things can be antagonistic to, to each other. You want a richness and variety in your level three technique, but also you want chalisti preserved. And therefore, the technique you need to become familiar enough with a rich variety of technique that you can perform that technique without thinking in a state of telicity. And so, you know, mm. as, as we've said before, my prefer, I've done a bunch, you know, we've done a uh, homie look as well, haven't we? You know, using vibrations from the voice. We we studied that. We talked about I've had it on a the great podcast. experience with that one, but yeah, I, I really yeah. enjoyed those episodes. That was more Amskar, wasn't it? Was that the Amskar? Well, it's we like looked at homie look at the Amskar level, the Yes, yeah. yes. But you could easily do level three homiluk and level four homiluk for sure. If you if you chose that as your way forwards in shamanism, you could have just as many level three homiluk techniques as, for instance, I've got level three dance techniques, as spirit dance techniques. That's entirely possible. Um, and you could create guruk and all the stuff we talk about at level four, which we're just getting into now on the podcast. All the stuff we talk about there is it entirely applicable to your homiluk technique, it would be entirely applicable to your um, 
uh, looking hang glide technique, your, your drum technique, and you know staff technique and all this kind of stuff. So the point is, level three is where you try to introduce some variety and you know it's it's great to study all those different things i've done a reasonable amount of homie look for instance even though spirit dance is my main thing i've done quite a lot of homie look in my life and you know it's a great thing i'm not i'm not saying that any one approach is superior the thing that i like about spirit dance is the variety a and b from what I've seen, it's the easiest type of technique to start incorporating spirit animals into your technique. The, the, I find that very easy in dance where it's much harder in things like homie look. Not impossible, but it's much harder. So so that's another reason why I think spirit dance is a is a good way forwards on that. So what is you, it quite yeah. is it is it is it um the case that bringing the animals in is more of an overarching aim to do with whatever technique you're doing? Um or is it the case that bringing the animals in is is just what something that's suited to the spirit dance that we're that we're talking about, or the 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 way of going into stage three that is f- favoured by Damon, so to speak? I I think that I, I wouldn't like to say spirit animals are essential to shamanism. I I do think that spirit animals are incredibly badly misunderstood by a lot of people, especially in the Western world. You know, I I, I had a listen to, I, I don't listen to other podcasts about shamanism generally, but I had to listen to a couple during the week uh, just, to, just to see, you know, our, our podcast is quite well established. And, and I've heard Joe and, and Graham and others mention you know, what people are talking about on other podcasts about shamanism. And I listened to one, and there was somebody talking about spirit animals. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, I'm not criticizing those people so much, but it was immediately apparent, like instantly apparent, that it was all imagination. You know, this particular person had been on an introduction to shamanism thing and had been introduced to their spirit animal by a shaman uh, and their spirit animal now followed them around and give them advice in life and this type of stuff um it, it that's to me that's just the same of the imaginary friend that, that some children develop as they you know <laughs> i think it's one of the the ways they try to deal with a miasma as they're growing up you're young the youngest children don't have imaginary friends because they are entirely natural. They're entirely natural beings. They are um, uh, very, very close to nature. And as we've, as we've noted many times, very young children can incre- it can exhibit some incredible shamanic abilities at ta- at, from time to time. This is That's not what I'm talking about. It's once a child's become educated and started being steeped in the miasma and started watching, you know, television programs, looking at the internet, all that kind of stuff, they, and, and going to school and being educated about all this kind of stuff, uh, having imagination built to them as an entirely positive thing in the school system, not not something that has an upside and a downside, you know, then then these these imaginary friends tend to appear. And to me, the way that most, not most, I say a lot of people understand spirit animals is like an imaginary friend that's giving them some advice and telling them they're doing the right thing and telling them not to worry about such and such a thing and everything's going to be okay and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if that gives people comfort, I have no problem with that, none whatsoever. Um, but... That has nothing to do with spirit animals, at least as I understand them. Uh, spirit animals are real animals that can be used by shamans as ways to make their technique richer, as characters yeah. of animals, and also to get a different outside perspective on human beings uh, as a whole that isn't our own perspective. That's where the value is to me. 
and like other just, lenses, like other lenses you can you can view yourself through. Yes, and, and other energies that you wouldn't necessarily think to incorporate. For instance, into your spirit dance, you wouldn't necessarily think to incorporate those energies yourself because you are a human being. But but if you look at the energies and movements that are used by wild animals and try to incorporate those into your spirit dance in human terms, it wasn't you that originated those energies, it was nature. But you can try to incorporate them into your spirit dance and learn an awful lot in that way through, you know, again, as nature is your teacher. So what I would say about the imaginary friend thing is that the problem with the imaginary friend is that is not nature, that's you coming up with that. Uh, spirit animals don't, ha- I, you know, I, I, I can't remember whether I had an imaginary friend when I was a little kid or not. You know, maybe I did or two. Um, but I can e- easily understand the imagination behind it. Uh, and I think I really understand what an imaginary kids are friend imaginative. is like. Kid, kids, yeah. by definition, are imaginative. Yes. You know, they're playing with the but world. The they're, flavor they're, they're... Of a sh- yeah, the flavor of a spirit animal is not that and is very radically different from that. That's That's yeah. probably the best way to put it from my point of view so anyway the the spirit animals i wouldn't say essential but looking you know anthropologically at the different manifestations of shamanism around the the world it's very hard to think one that doesn't have spirit animals so it's it's they're, they're not essential but it seems that most shamans through the ages have seen the value in spirit animals and Therefore, and the value is simply that it, it 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 makes your life a lot easier. You don't have to think very hard or work very hard to have exemplars that can help to make your guru, your weave, your weave of energy richer and more sustained and more engaged with nature because nature has provided these exemplars for you in the form of wild animals. That's the the way that I look at it. And so the dance is there to generate the weave and the guruk. And the richer the weave, the first of all, the richer the weave, the better radar for nature you have, and therefore nature is able to teach you a lot more. When you start interacting with the environment in your spirit dance, for instance you are able to learn a lot more if if that weave that you're creating and engaging in, as it starts to interact and cross over the weave of energy that's in the natural environment that you're operating in, your grove, if you like, then you will learn a lot more if you have a rich radar. And animals provide that. Spirit animals provide that. And that will always be true for sure for drum technique and sure for homie look and other types of technique just it's very very true for spirit dance that's probably the best way to put it does that make some kind of sense mate uh, it makes it makes perfect sense yeah and uh we did do an episode earlier on on, on um, the word spirit and i know we keep bringing it up but it is my favorite episode i think it is yours as well but i think episode five or six when we talked about the word spirit and we did um, dive into that a bit more um but also you know just listening to you then, as 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 you know, Damon, we've got a shared document where we share ideas for episodes and stuff, and it'd be fascinating to explore. And that is actually one of the episodes that that we've got as an idea there, just exploring that whole spirit mm. animal world a little in in a little bit more detail, yeah. um, and also about kids as well, because I think that's that's a very interesting topic to discuss as well, as far as shamanism and 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 kids go, and what they lose, and what they and and how yeah, how we absolutely. as adults aspire to become kids again in in the pursuit of shamanic technique to a certain extent, of course. Yeah, I, I think in terms of that document, we need to set aside a bit of time. I mean, me and you to sit down, go through that, and also there's an area in the um, patrons discussion group, power patrons discussion group. Uh, we need to go through that as well and sort of mesh it in yeah. with the document. And so that we've got, the thing is, we said this when we started this podcast, we will never run out of episode topics, <laughs> will we? It's just not remotely going to happen. I was sort of no. thinking, you know, oh no, recently we just, we, we started out on the sort of level four, the guru stuff. And I thought we could just keep going at this level, you know, forever. We wouldn't really have to stop. <laughs> Uh, sooner or later, we'll have to draw a line under it and, and get onto Modoc. We'll probably have some disappointed listeners, you know, but but I'm just thinking we could go forever on Guruk. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 
Well, I mean, I'm just keen on making sure that we keep these sort of episodes going where they're a little bit simpler, they're a little bit more easygoing, mm. and they're like, they're like people can listen to them and get a little bit more of a flavour about what we're about rather than having to jump straight into one of the more complicated episodes because it's not very beginner friendly, I guess. So, you know, as, as we always say with this podcast, it is more of an encyclopedia that you, that you need to start from the beginning or like a, maybe like maybe a better yeah. analogy would be a, just a course, you know, start at the beginning and go, go through yeah. the, ep- go through the episodes. We used to mention that a lot, didn't we? We should probably mention that more often because we may get new listeners coming on. And yes. Thinking, what on earth, you know? <laughs> what are all these <laughs> strange terms that you're saying? <laughs> Um, yeah. So, yeah. Start so, from episode yeah. one. If you, if you're new to the podcast, <laughs> start from episode one. Okay. So that's epi- yeah. that's um, episode. That's stage three. So did you did you um, yeah. give a brief overview of stage four just now? So I think we got, Guruk, we got into the weeds with stage three again. Let, let's just give an idea for Guruk. Guruk is how through the application of your level three technique, whatever it is, you create a radar for nature that is greater than yourself. It's a, a pattern yeah. of energy that extends both in front of you and behind you in your technique in time and space. And you will, at level five, you will be using that. So it's important to be able to do it. But it's also really important not to imagine it. You need to be able to genuinely create that weave. And as we said before, We've given you some tips in terms of how you know whether it's genuine or not. We've given you aspects of physical chelicity, for instance, which you can objectively rate yourself on in terms of when you're doing, if you're doing spirit dance, for instance, you can objectively rate yourself on to a certain extent. Am I doing Ashgui? Am I doing Numluk? Am I doing Bokki? Am I doing Murich? Am I doing Berntaglach? And am I thinking or not thinking, which is the one we want, is all of the above happening in my spirit dance? Um, and am I getting a sense f- for the overarching energy flow and uh, ebb and flow, weave spirals, patterns that are going on with the energy inside my spirit dance or whatever other level three technique that I'm doing? Of all of those things in place, objectively, if you're adding on animal spirits, which you certainly can do at level four, you put animal spirits into the mix, you can get somebody else to, especially somebody who's also a practicing shaman, you know, to have a look at what you're doing, to interact with you. And they can cross compare you, your tiger, your crane, to videos of wild animals on YouTube, for instance. They can do an objective comparison there. And can they see the flavor of that animal in you? Or did they just see somebody growling and, and making claws? <laughs> you know, a human being growling and making claw shapes. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. So there are ways of testing. But the point is, it, it shouldn't really be somebody else testing you. It should be you keeping you on it. We've said many times, we, the reason you start with the foundation for chillicity is to sidestep the imagination trap. Anything that you come to understand experientially through chalisti, you can have a high degree of confidence in because you are not thinking and therefore you're not imagining and therefore you're not inventing and it, it, and, and convincing yourself that something is going on. Yeah. So I know this is an overview episode, but I think the it's really important when we start getting to sort of level four to, oh, it's really important on level one, isn't it? But to just <laughs> remind people to yeah. listen to the episodes about the imagination trap. What did we call it? The number one barrier to learning shamanism. It was an early episode. Pit, I can't remember what we called it. Was, it. It's the pitfalls of learning shamanism. I think it was episode two or three. Yeah. Um, I think it was episode three, the pitfalls of learning shamanism. And we rather optimistically called it part one and then never, never returned to it. <laughs> so, um, no, well, let's return to it. Let's return to it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Because there are other um, pitfalls, but that's far and away the biggest one. Um, yeah. The so imagination yeah. trap. Um, so yeah, so, so Guruk, that's, that's its purpose is to, you're creating, you know, I'm using the word radar as an analogy. Yeah. What's shamanism yeah. about? It's about learning from nature, 
What do you learn from nature through? Well, you become an empty vessel. That's level one. You learn through your body. That's level two. You learn through your movement or the activities that you carry out. That's level three. And you learn through the energy that's employed within those movements and that same energy that interacts with the energy within the environment in which you find yourself. That's level four. Um, so there's a overall... And, and if you were Sorry. doing something, say, like Humuluk, um, this might be opening up a can of worms, but let's say Humuluk, which is by definition not as movement-based, um, would uh, would the same principle apply for stage four? Yes, of four? course. Yes, of course. But because you know, you're still you're sending out those signals into the na- into nature, aren't you, with the with the voice and the yes. vibrations this time, I guess. But if you look at what you know, real shamans do they they combine them, don't they? I, I do that. You know, I combine my drum technique with spirit dance. I combine my drum technique with homolock. That's quite cool, actually. I combine homolock with spirit dance, yeah? Uh, because the yeah. more combination like that you do, the richer you make the weave. Yeah, so there's there's no disadvantage to richness in your guruk. That's the... There are only advantages to increasing the richness in the guruk. Oh, there is a disadvantage. Sorry, there's always a disadvantage. Something. It's it takes a lot more hard work <laughs> to get the riches oh, okay. there and maintain chelicity. <laughs> That's the only disadvantage. <laughs> I'm gonna have to start calling you Uncle Damon now, aren't I? Uncle yeah, Damon. Go for it, mate. That's I, I, I the, the, treat uh... that as a badge of honour, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. you be taking those drugs, you. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, so this is the one I'm quite excited about hearing hearing more of. Um, because we've not really touched on it very much, and that is stage five, which is yeah, the journey, the mother, isn't it? I, the is it, is No, it, stage is five is not the journey. Yeah, stage five is mother. Ah, is that stage six? Six is okay. six okay. is again stage six. Ilal, it, and the journey, the spirit journey, is an example of level six technique. It's far and away the most famous one, but it's definitely not the only example. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember you back in episode one, I think, you were talking about the seven stages and you said, and uh, and then we're on to the journey, the Ilal. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to get on to that one. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, so, if you've gone on this, po- this this thing that these people on this podcast that I was listening to were done, you could have been doing the journey in your very first seminar. You'd have been away, mate. So uh, <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, uh, check out that other podcast if you want to, you know, Speed if, things if you want up. to do it straight away, yes. <laughs> I'm not doing Uncle up. Damon's crazy long, slow way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Oh, we're going to get in trouble. Okay. Oh, I mean, um, there's, there's also, I mean, just another thing. I mean, we, we, we might, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody who's producing podcasts. I know how much work goes into these things. The uh, if, if your podcast is about animism, don't call it a podcast about shamanism. And have yeah. no shamanism whatsoever on your podcast. Yeah, that that's another, you know, just a bit of friendly advice. But a lot of what people are calling shamanism podcasts are also, are actually animism podcasts. Nature is wonderful. Yes, we know it's wonderful. Nobody knows that more than me. I love it. You know, feeling one with the universe and out in the sunshine, up on the moor or down at the beach in the surf. And, and and appreciating the wonderful things that nature has given us uh, and feeling, you know, like, like you know, it, it's the, I call it the, um, the Louis Armstrong wonderful world syndrome, you know. There's absolutely yeah. nothing wrong with that. That is not shamanism, that's animism, just to be clear. And so why not, you know, you call, if that's what your podcast is about, call it the animism podcast, <laughs> I guess, you know. You won't get as but many anyway, views, though. Anyway. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Anyway, uh, that's me done listening to Shamanism podcast. I just thought I'd mention <laughs> well, it. Two, two episodes. Eh? I don't How think many episodes is that? <laughs> uh, one episode of two different podcasts I listen to. Yeah, I'm done now. Um, two episodes but, and you're done. Yeah, but I, it's not that I want to rubbish other podcasts. It's just I've never listened to them in all the time we've been doing this, and I thought it was probably a useful thing to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You well, know, we, you know, we're not yeah. naming any podcasts, so it's all good. Yeah, exactly. It's all good. Exactly. Yeah. And cool. we don't want to be spreading hate, do we, or anything anything silly like that. Oh, we'll give him a hug. Yeah. Give him a hug. We'll give him a hug. Yeah. Um, so stage so, five. The Mordok. 
Yes. Okay. So you've gone to all this trouble, <laughs> Uncle Damon's approach. You've got this incredibly rich weave in your guru that you are able to maintain and uh, to learn from. And it starts, as we said, through experience, it starts to interact with the weave of the environment that you're in and you get this crossover. And and that crossover is what Modoc is all about. It is, as you become more and more familiar with your spirit dance, the the transitional or, or transitory nature of your spirit dance, the morphing nature of your spirit dance, the morphing nature of your energy weave, the places where the weave interacts with the weave of the natural environment start to naturally become more prominent to you in terms of your, I guess you'd say, your AMSCO level perception of the weave. They start mm-hmm. to, I wouldn't like to say shine, but because that suggests some sort of visual imagery and there is none, but they they become increasingly prominent through the years as you practice your, in, in my case, spirit dance, they become increasingly prominent. And the stuff that is you, you know, your weave, tends to start to fall by the wayside. And that thing is modok, that thing that becomes prominent through your repeated track, uh, practice of your level for technique is modok. And first of all, it's an incredibly difficult thing to get to. If you're doing it genuinely, I mean, I find it incredibly difficult. Um, it, it takes a huge amount of practice. How many hours... Of spirit dance before I started to get a handle on Mordoch. Um, I don't know. I wasn't timing myself. But, you know, that whole thing with Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hours, that that rings true to me. Well, it um, also depends how, yeah. what you are considering practice, doesn't it? Because you, you, uh, you've you done martial arts all your life, which involves movement, particularly Xing Yi, which involves movement with the animals. So I guess it depends what if, if you mean dedicated practice time to to this specific I just endeavor, mean dancing. Mean just I just mean spirit dancing. dance in a state of chillisty. Uh, mm. Obviously, spirit dance practice also includes stuff that's not in a state of chillisty, where you're picking up new movements, you're picking up new techniques and add them into the weave. Shamanism's all about techniques, but the the modok is about something that emerges out of the guruk that you're creating. And you will know what it is I, I, the good, the good thing is I can't actually tell you what it is because it's impossible to put into words. But you will increasingly, if you keep practicing and increasing the richness of your guru, uh, increasing the variety and increasing the depth of the chalisti. And we've talked about that quickening thing where the the, the energy flux and transition tends to quicken itself. That. Mm that stuff will all lead you towards Modoch. And the good news is I don't need to tell you what Modoch is, because I can't anyway. It will start to become increasingly known to you. It's not a sudden overnight revelation. Oh, I've achieved enlightenment and my body is all shining or something. It's nothing like that. It's slow. It's gradual. Modoch is something that creeps up on you and it become, you become more and more aware of it and then all, all, all of a sudden, I guess the sudden thing is you realize that it's been there for quite a while when you first notice it. Do you follow what I mean? It snuck up on you in that way. Um, and then you need to be able to, just like we did with the weave, you need to, in, in terms of developing our AMSCO lightweight observation of self awareness of the energy weave, the guruk, we need to now apply level two technique, the Amsco technique to level five. We need to develop our lightweight observation of self-awareness of the modok as well um, before we start doing anything with it. Um, ov- obviously, that is going to become our vessel if we if we do want to do a spirit dance at level six, uh, sorry, a, a spirit journey at level six, then Modok is going to be the vessel that we use to conduct that spirit journey. 
But as I said, this is it's not the only technique at level six. So, so what we start applying at level five, which I do not want to get into until we've done it for level four, because to me, we're not we're nowhere near halfway through level four on the podcast, let alone, you know, level five. But there are a yeah. whole bunch of techniques that you can also apply at level five. Uh, once you get the Mordok awareness, you know what I mean by awareness? I don't mean on the baseline. I mean top line, mid line, baseline, all acting as one, creative realm, continuative realm, receptive realm, all acting together as one. Holistically, you have the, developed the Amskar level awareness of the Mordok within your Guru. Um, it emerges in in a way. It's kind of born within your guru. As I think I mentioned Stella Nebulae, uh the other day, which is a strange analogy. Analogy, but in a way, Modoc is born also like stars within a Stella Nebula. It, that's that's how it comes out. And the Nebula would be your guru, would be your weave there. The the trick then is you want to. For, this is the probably the hardest translation. The hardest. Um, thing to put in English that I could try to convey to date on the podcast, but you want to slip onto the Mordoch. You want to slip onto the vessel mm. within your spirit dance. Mm. And you will know how to do that. You need the, the first time you try it, the whole thing's going to collapse, right? The whole thing's just going to collapse. And the reason I use the term slip onto is on mount, it's very gentle, it's very subtle. If you fly straight at it and try to plunge yourself into it like you're driving into a swimming pool, the whole thing will collapse and you'll be, you're, you're not, not only will your gutter be gone, your bag tamsis will be gone, but you probably will try that a few times because you'll be so you'll elated. You'll crashing back down to earth. Won't you'll you? be so elated that you've got a handle on the Modoc that mm. you want to sort of grab it and nothing makes the Modoc move away from you faster than trying to grab hold of it. Uh, in a spiritual sense, I mean. So it needs to be light. It's more like uh, a friendship. I think we talked a few times about the the sort of shamanistic people out in the Western Mongolia who hunt with golden eagles. Uh, they develop a sort of shamanistic friendship with these eagles because, you know, the eagle is a very capable and dangerous animal. You can't just bribe it like you can a small bird of prey when you're a human. The, the, the eagles, you know, not to put too fine a point, and it's perfectly capable of ripping your head off, you know. <laughs> so mm, it's mm. like, you know, you have to have a different relationship with it. And that's the same sort of relationship you want to develop with Modok, is a, a very lightweight partnership that gradually merges. So obviously there's a lot of meld applied in Modok technique leads to start off with. Uh, and slipping on the vents is the first thing. Once you can do that, and that takes a huge amount of practice, once you can do that, first thing I'll say is you'll know you've done that because your state of chalicity will be very, very, very deep. Yeah. Your, mm. Once you're in that state, the, you know, I don't know, it'd be interesting to put one of those brain scanners on somebody who's doing Mordok level technique, level five level technique. You'll probably find virtually no activity. I would guess there would be virtually no activity going on in that brain. Um, wow. Despite the high level of activity that's actually going on, I'm sure motor functions and stuff, but, but you know, in terms of cerebral activity, the cerebral cortex, in a way, I would guess, I mean, I've never done this as a study or anything. It would be interesting. In, in the old it days, I might have been able to get the wherewithal all together, but I never thought of it. The, the You will be in... Um, a state of chalicity so deep that you it, not not I don't mean this in a negative way that you feel like you've almost drowned in chalicity. That will you will know if you have that sense that you're drowned in your own chalicity, not in a negative way. There's no negative effect. This this thing's not going to kill you or anything like real drowning will, but you've actually drowned in your own chalicity. You will know that you have done quite well in terms of slipping onto that vessel, slipping onto the mudok. I'm mounting the Bodoch. Uh, yeah. Uncle and Damon ton- might shout. At, my, Uncle Damon might shout at me, but let's 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 try this. So, an altered state of consciousness. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, it's not an altered state of consciousness. It's shutting consciousness off. Got you. 
Yeah. All the states of consciousness are used in shamanism, but modok is just like the exact opposite of that. It's ah, a non-state okay. of consciousness, but you're, you're unconscious, but you're not unconscious, if you see what I mean. That, that word unconscious yeah, has yeah. different meanings in English, doesn't it? And, yeah. and we're going to have loads of this, mate. When we eventually do get onto detail on level five on the podcast, it is going to be so hard to put things into words. I'll tell you now. I have, as it There's going to be plenty moment, of Uncle Damon moments. I have no <laughs> idea how we're going to do that, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. Yeah. I remember um, when when we were talking about this, one thing you did say, uh, and this was years ago now, but you said that when it comes to, um, and I'll, I'll use the vessel as the example because that's what you were talking about at the time, you said when, when, you, when it comes to building the vessel and um, and uh, feeling that, it, it, it'll it'll be obvious. It'll be something that's very clear to you. It'll, it'll For sure. Sort of, it won't. There won't be any ambiguity to it. You'll it know what you're other. doing. It will be other. It will. The first time you do it, well, not the first time you do it. The first time you do it, it won't last very long. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. The yeah. first time you manage to get it going and maintain it, it will be other than anything that you've experienced in your life, probably. And, and that's okay. That's where a lot of the fear comes into shamanism. You know, we're sort of trained to be afraid of the dark, aren't we? Mm. The, the This is where, you know, Christianity's created all these goblins and demons and all these kind of things that inhabit those dark places that are out there in nature. It, it's, yeah, you know, so stay away from nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, just check out the, the first few episodes of our Genesis, series on Genesis in, in uh, Heretics, the Heretics yeah. podcast. Uh, you know, we were, it, as far as the Christian church is concerned, we were born in the garden. Hey, the garden's nature, isn't it? Anyway, and we kicked ourselves out the garden, you know, an esoteric understanding, or God kicked us out for whatever reason, through, you know, gaining knowledge of good and evil. That's, in a certain extent, that's true. We live for three, four million years in the garden, as every wild animal in the world today still lives in the garden, hopefully, if they haven't destroyed the poor thing's garden uh the poor thing's habitat you know so 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 we kicked ourselves out of that that's absolutely true we didn't do it in the way that described in genesis but we did do it we created these exoteric religions we made people fearful there is nothing to fear in nature that doesn't mean that nature can't be dangerous but if you're in a, a natural state if you're part of nature a that doesn't bother you and b you can do something about it those those are the kind of uh, upsides of dissolving within nature, which is ultimately what you're trying to do as a shaman. The, the Once you get to the state with your modok that you can hang in that place, that deep, deep state of chillisty, where you are riding along the guruk, not just your guruk, but nature's guruk, and, and you are specially riding or slipping along those interaction points, which have now become very, very strong. If you practice your spirit dance that much, they, they should be strong by this point in time. And if none of this is happening, we, we know what to do by now. Practice level four, practice level three, practice level two, practice level one. Uh, once you're in that place, then you can start to apply level five techniques, which I'm not even going to bother going into now because this episode will end up being far too long. Um, no, and I, mean, I don't really want to do it out of sequence. It won't make any sense until yep. we've got the yep, other yep. level this four is, this technique. Is, this is absolutely an overview. Um, but but one thing that springs to mind um, when you're talking about the vessel is that you you, um, you hear quite a lot of mythical stories um, in various religions all over the world, um, from all parts of the world, um, about this kind of theme. So you have something like uh, the the unicorn, but you mount the Chilean, unicorn yeah. and you tr the Chilean, you have the canoe, which I think is a, I'm not sure where that's from, but I'm sure I've, yeah. I've read about the canoe somewhere. The chariot have, of Sol um, Invictus. The, the, yeah. the chariot, yeah. And you've got yeah. these, um, these various visual metaphors or what I'm presuming are metaphors for something real, which is the, the vessel for want of a better word, in stage uh, in stage five, 
Would that be correct? Would that be? Would those be references to, the, or, or a, they, a way that human beings can understand what this is in terms of something visual and something that but can be communicated? Before they became folklore, before they became myth, and before they became exoteric, they were post-rationalizations. They were yeah. Once you start getting into level five technique, you start to see hints of level six, and that is when you are going to have some experiences that are things that, I mean, just the general MODOK experience in itself is quite unusual. It's not unpleasant, but it, it it's, you know, to show you how otherworldly it is, or how, how not otherworldly, how outside the normal person's experience it is. I use the word, English word, drowning, in a positive sense with regard to MODOK, drowning in chelicity. That is... Um, the best way I can describe it. But when I'm using that word drowning in English, that's always an entirely negative kind of sense. Here I'm using it in a positive sense. Uh, it's not an unpleasant feeling. It's not a pleasant feeling. It's not an unpleasant feeling. It just just is. The issue is that, that n not so much just the Modoc experience, but then the Ilal experience, shamans of the past, through the Modoc technique, not Modoc itself, but the Modoc technique. So remember, we're going to learn Modoc at level five. We're going to get the ability to do that, pick up that ability. And then we're going to start applying techniques to the Modoc that will enable us to do level six technique. And as soon as you start getting hints of those level six techniques and their effects, it's a, what a lot of the average person in the street would call, there's going to be some weird stuff. That's probably the best way to put it, yeah. yeah. And, and people, baseline people, like to baseline rationalize weird stuff. It's not weird as long as you don't take it down to the baseline. It's only when you attempt stupidly to rationalize it with the miasma on the baseline, in cultural terms, that it starts to appear weird. It wasn't weird at the time, do you follow what I mean? And so, yeah. so that is a really important uh, aspect and that is the first hints of the journey, the Ilal, the, or whatever level six technique that you're going to apply. The Ilal is by far and away the most famous one. And all yeah. I'm going to say about the Ilal, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because there's tons of technique at the Ilal level as well. Ilal is a directed, the technique at I level, level, level six level is heavily bat, it's heavily directed. It's, it's the level where you can start making practical application of your shamanic technique because you can go into the technique with some objective. And that objective needs to be held despite all the crazy amount of distractions that you're going to encounter in the technique, in the level six technique. You're going to have distractions thrown at you left, right, and center. And if you have sufficient bat to ignore those distractions, to plow on through, you get to a place where your objective or hints at how your objective can be achieved can be derived from nature. And those hints, so when you come back from the journey, when this technique collapses, you've kind of got some kind of answers to yeah. your original objective as long as you are able to maintain it and not get distracted. But the problem is the distractions are so heavy that afterwards people start to, I know, for instance, Glenn, one of my more, more advanced students for shamanism, uh, or the people who I've, I've guided more advancedly, I don't know how to put that, uh, he had a lot of difficulty when he first started doing this stuff, not trying to understand what all of these things that he was seeing, experiencing, quote unquote, meant. Uh, uh, sorry, Glenn, if you listen, love you, mate. Um, but just I'm just picking you out because you got quite a long way with this, mate. I'm not picking on you. Um, the, it's a mistake to try to understand the distractions because the distractions are just that, they're distractions. And a lot of people try to rationalize that when they come back. And that's where the whole thing goes pear-shaped. That's not shamanism. That's just human imagination. It's the miasma on steroids, basically. Or the, the miasma on um, psychoactive substances. That's what that is. The, mm. the, uh, 
the objective itself is what's important. And the ILL can take you to a place where the object, how the objective either can be met or how it can be met can become apparent to you. Afterwards, you have no idea. Because for ILL, you've been in such a deep state of chelicity that you have no idea really what happened or how that question was answered for you. But it was answered and you know what the answer is. The problem is somebody else then asks you what that is. What what did you learn? N- now mm. it's, oh, there was this chilling, you know. <laughs> you have to yeah. visualize it in some way to visualize yeah. the, the journey. Or there's this fiery chariot that took me across the sky to the audience chamber of the lords of heaven. And they were screened off from me behind a, like a, uh, a paper that, screen. I was going to bring that up because it's there was such a, a, light such a powerful behind them. visual, and I could yeah. see their shapes moving. They do this in the in the, another great visual in the, the chemical wedding as well. I could see their shapes moving behind the translucent screen, and the patterns that they made on the screen spoke to me, and I I understood what the correct course of action was. You know, where should I take the sheep so that they don't die in the winter cold? Yeah, this sort of stuff. You know, whatever it is, I I, I understood the answer. And then I came back. The Chilean brought me back. The chariot brought me back. Whatever it is, the vessel brought me back. Mm. And now I know the answer. And in the experience of it, there was no Chilean. There was no chariot. There was no things. These things are just somebody trying to come up with analogies for what they actually experienced, which is absolutely impossible to put it into words. <laughs> Completely impossible. And my, Hence rather allegory. than coming up with, allegories and stuff I've, I've always preferred not even to to worry about it you know I don't I, I sort of train myself enough in my life that I don't try and rationalize things on the baseline I find it quite unpleasant to try to do so really uh, I'm the last person that should have started a podcast from that <laughs> from that viewpoint <laughs> maybe it was a mistake after all Joe I don't know um, so so that's that's what the ILL is about and then the neck Dell the neck is something very special. Um, Could I just ask so, one thing? Uh, yeah. So I just want to clarify yeah. one thing, and that is, um, yeah. of course, you were talking about an objective, and of course, in shamanic folklore, you know, everybody's heard of it. You take, you, you go off on your journey, and you come back with an answer. And um, yeah. I imagine that the um, the objective can be can be uh, anything, but the classic example of that um, in Uncle Damon terminology and, and, and you know with all the hard work that proceeds up to it is as a shaman your job is to look after your tribe and yes. be the guide for that tribe and in the process of being that guide you will have to ask ask certain questions and it's this process where you can you go on the on the journey and you come back with a feeling or an intuition of the answer that's that's the uh that's yeah, and idea, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to describe that as something vague. Very often it's a very certain answer that you get in that. Yeah. Uh, you know, human beings, we always have, oh, should I do this, should I do that? Should I, you know, there's all these options, what should I do? And maybe this is a good idea, so I'll try this one. That's very different mm. from a spirit journey kind of answer. They're, they're very certain, those answers. Um, so, and does... that's another way to know if it's real or not. You know, because there was something mm. vague, you know, beware the Ides of March. Well, that wasn't that vague, was it? That was actually that was actually pretty that was actually pretty good. Uh but if mm. it's something vague, you know, uh watch out for the for the you know, the man in shadow or something like that, you know, a Nostradamus type of vagueness thing, then mm. then that's not so good. Um that probably was not real, that was probably imagination. Yeah. Well there's so, one other thing that um that really struck me, uh, and you said that um, stage six, the journey isn't necessarily the only technique, and um, or even so, within the journey, that's not the only technique. Yeah, so just like okay. stage three, stage four, stage five, stage six, there are whole portfolios of technique at these levels, and on this podcast, as we get through it, we will go into portfolio of stage four technique. We'll just start. At out on that, we will go into a portfolio of stage five technique. We'll go into a portfolio of stage six technique, and there's not really any technique at stage seven, but we will we will talk about it for sure. Yeah. So, to give a flavour of it, is there one thing you could say that would be an example of something other than the journey at stage six? So, or is that is that an incredibly 
difficult question. The, the, well, it depends what you... Yes, it's it's it requires a foundational understanding to discuss. Yeah. You can call anything a journey at stage six. That's the issue. But it may not yeah. be experienced as a physical journey. So can you... Can you do level six technique without flying off into the sky? Yes, you absolutely can. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. Or down into the underworld or anything like that. You don't have to physically go anywhere. But in a way, what you have to do with level six technique where you're not, you know, you're just doing it where you are, you you need to... Um, oh, it's so hard. You need to um, characterize in some way the activity that you're undertaking. And you could use the English word journey to apply to any of those things. You could do, yeah. Mm. But you could mm. use whole different words, yeah. But personally, I don't like to use words because <laughs> it yeah, gets, yeah, words yeah, get yeah. really problematic. So you go up the levels, words so, get really problematic. Would would it be correct to, to say um, that, the primary purpose of stage six is to have an objective and gain an understanding or, or, or an answer to that objective. And then there's a, a whole host of techniques which allow you to do that. But but that's the main underpinning purpose of stage six. Would that be a correct That's the to objective say? at stage six. It's not the objective of stage six. The objective of stage six is to get you to save seven. But it's the objective in stage six technique, yes. Gotcha. It's worth gotcha. the focus. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And there are, of course, yeah. a variety of techniques in stage. Well, that's absolutely six. tons. And we will talk about them, but I just don't want to do them out of order. That's, that's the point. We're currently just starting out on stage four. So yeah. that's the, uh, yeah. What I don't want to do is have people running off and trying some stage six technique when we haven't even, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, we are approaching the hour here, so... Uh, one other thing want I wanted to touch? mention, mate. Yep. Oh, uh, you, one of your favourite subjects, psychoactive substances, catalysts, whatever mm. you want to call them. Stage five, which you mentioned, the MODOK, that's the legitimate... If you want to, you don't have to. You can do stage five quite happily. I do with without them, uh, but that's the legitimate application to them. Remember the thing I was saying about slipping onto the MODOK? That, that facilitation of that relationship with the Mordok, that yes. is the legitimate application of those things, a lot of them anyway. Uh, it's, uh, I remember you, you described yeah. it as a lubricant. A, yeah, a like a lubricant to slip you on the vessel. So if you imagine, yeah, the, oh, if you imagine, the vessel is quite <laughs> rough, you're quite rough, and the, the, yeah. they can be used to, to smooth that melding. Yeah, let's use the word meld. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So so that's it. And then, of course, level seven, we should just talk about it. Stage seven and Negdel. The ultimate purpose of shamanism. You know, shamanism's purpose, as you go through your life as a shaman, shamanism's purpose changes. Um, and you come to the point in your life where you start to appreciate the Negdel. What's a shaman ultimately trying to achieve? The shaman is ultimately trying to achieve a nectar, or in Japanese, that would be like hinagata. Uh, they are trying to achieve a union, a full and complete union with nature. There is no difference between nature and self. Uh, mm. The, the distance has, difference has entirely dissolved. And that's what the nectar is about. There are also, when you're not in the neck del, there are aspects of shamanic technique that come through long years and years of hard practice that hang with you. Uh, I think we mentioned my rather, I guess it's a touch wood thing, but my rather interesting record with uh, never having been in a motor accident despite being uh, somebody who drives for a living. Um, yeah. I've spent basically 22 years on the road and I've never been in an accident of any kind. That I've seen the places where I would have been in an accident. Uh, many, many times I would have been actually probably wiped out a couple of times by trucks and stuff. Uh, but it didn't happen because of my shamanism. I guess you could say because of my neck del. Um, and that's just because of the, the deep awareness that you get of what's going on around you in shamanism. And not say it's 100% purpose. And what I would say is shamanism doesn't, 
stop you tripping up. You still trip up, but it stops you falling down. That's the, the probably the best mm. way to put it. Uh, and the nectel is is nature. Nectel is a synonym for nature, and you are nectel, and nectel is nature. So what does that tell you? Yeah, you are nature. Um, nectel is like the ultimate animism. Yeah, and and it's nice. And some people, not very many, some of the great shamans, Nakayama Miki, could uh, manage to achieve a state of nectel for incredibly extended periods of time. I mean, for me, 10 minutes is a joy, right? If I could achieve a full state of Nechdel for 10 minutes, that is, that would be an absolute joy. She did it for 50 years. That's five zero, not 15. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Nonstop. So there's a, there's a shaman for you. That's one of the reasons why I keep mentioning her. And incidentally, I did a bit of a translation that I did with my teacher on on the patrons area of Mickey's the the some of the well just a bit of Mickey's voluminous shamanic writings. She did the, she did a shamanic technique of automatic writing. There you are. You asked what's another example of a shamanic technique? Automatic writing. Oh. There's another one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been working on the uh, interpretation of that, and that will be appearing very shortly on the patrons area. Well, that's another really interesting route to go down, um, Nakayama Miki, because uh, I remember when we first started doing this stuff and I used to, um, you know, come over to the um, the, the Tenrikyo um, do's, shall we say, you know, we, we did our rituals, we did our clappy clappy stuff. And then afterwards we used to sit down and we would talk through the, uh, through the writings, wouldn't we? And that's right. Slowly but surely, it's like just listening to that just made sense because it wasn't all the religious, what you might consider uh, religious nonsensey stuff. It's all it's it's all practical stuff. It's all just well. There is tons you know, of religious nonsense it, it stuff. It's very real. Well, well, the the issue is it's it's been exotericized, as it happens with all of these religions. These you know, typically what happens is a shaman. Uh, teaches some people how to apply shamanic technique. And those people get on well with it, and they, they have quite good results, usually in a localized area around the shaman. You know, the shaman's helping their tribe, and this happened with Miki. Yeah. And then that tends to attract other people to those people. And you so you get a sort of growing effect with it. And, you know, more and more people start to join that community, which is fine as long as the shaman... The original shaman is still alive. But Mickey died, and once she died, things started inevitably exotericizing. People started believing things instead of practicing technique. They were believing things. Actually, they banned some of the techniques. So, so yes, that stuff that we did was to get around the... And it happened quick, didn't it? It happened so quick. Yeah, with yeah. it was to get around the dreadful mistranslations of what she'd written, uh, we would we would talk through it. We'd effectively translate it on the fly, and, and Sensei Kat Sensei and I would do that in a lot more detail when you guys went there. And so that's mm. this is what I'm putting onto the the patrons area. I don't want to put it out in the open because, as you know, I had in those days I had to be very very careful that I didn't upset anybody, and I still do to a certain extent. Um, those there's a lot of people in Mickey's tradition, who've been very kind to me over the years, and I do not want to upset them. My my teachers, unfortunately, passed away, both of them from that tradition, uh, Kaoko and, and Aichi. Uh, I love them dearly. And so that reduces the pressure on me a little bit, but I'm quite happy to have it in the patron's area uh, where it's not public access. That's rather, I'd rather would put that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And if we ever do an absolute an episode on Tenrikyo, or on any of the other, because you remember Tabiko is not the only uh, religious group descended from Miki's tradition. There's Hon Michi, there's Kanro Dairi Shido Kyakai, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, Honbushin, uh, there, there are just loads of them. Um, all valid in the wrong way, all valid flavors of exotericism derived from Miki's esotericism, from our shamanism. Um, mm. If we ever do an episode on that, which we probably will, we could do uh, an episode on uh, religious traditions descended from Miki. 
then I yeah. think I'll also stick that in the patrons area. I don't think I'll put it. I don't think I'll put it live because I really don't want to upset anybody. Um, as you know, yeah. I want to do without intending. Um, yeah, and you know that because just because I don't agree with people doesn't mean I can't be friends with those people, and I have to be respectful towards them. And there you go. That's a sentiment that's missing these days with the advent of uh, Twitter and the uh, and the like. But yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent agree. Um, just because you don't agree with somebody doesn't mean you cannot be friends. Hundred um, percent. Okay, Demon. So shall we leave it there? Let's do that, mate. That was quite a uh, piece more. That's about an hour. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, guys, thank you so much for listening. It's uh, It's been a pleasure as always. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. Make sure you check out patreon.com slash woven energy. You can support us over there. Leave a review on any of the uh, your chosen podcast uh, environments. Leave us a review. It does help us get our podcast in front, of, um, in front of more people, which is always good. Thanks a lot, and we will see you in the next one. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. All the best.